Hi, and welcome to Talk Straight Bible. I'm your host, Jeremiah Santanetti, and today I'm Put Your Face in the Torah. I get so excited about the Word of God because it is so good. When you live by the Word of God and you depend on it, it just makes you so alive. And the Bible tells us that Jesus said when the disciples, uh, when he was talking to the disciples in John chapter 6, man, you know, you know, Jesus asked a very important question. He said, do you want to leave me too? Because about 5,000 people have left him after he preached this tremendous sermon. And Peter, wow, there you go, Peter. Peter opened up his mouth and said, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Let's get into the words of eternal life. We're looking at Psalms 119, verse 87, and it says, They had almost finished me on the earth, but I did not forsake your commandments. They had almost finished me on the earth, but I did not forsake your commandment. Again, going through trials and tribulations sometimes can take our eyes, our focus off of that which is mostly important. Remember that we serve a Savior who has passed through the heavens and we can always go to his throne to help us in time of need. Why? Because we have a high priest who knows our infirmities. He knows our weaknesses. Matter of fact, you know what? I want to go there. Let's go to, uh, if you have your pads and your Bible, to Hebrews chapter 4. And uh, let's start off with that because it's, it's really, really good. And let's look at... Um, uh, verse 14, since then we have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted just as we are yet without sin. The word yet actually is not in the original translation or in the in the in the article. So it actually reads, but was in all points tempted just as we are without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. And we see that right here in this particular Psalm, because here he is going through. Now, some, again, they talk about that this is really talking about David. They say that this is talking about David when he was running from, <laughs> from Absalom. His own son had taken over the kingdom and he had to run for his life, etc. But whatever the cause may be, whatever it may be, this person here is going through tribulation. They've been going through tribulation as you read uh, all the verses of the calf. Wow, it's been tremendous persecution, affliction, and he says here, they almost finished me off. They almost took me off the earth, but I did not forsake your commandments. Now, let's look at the word here. Um, they had almost, okay? So we're going into the ancient Hebrew, and you know something about the ancient Hebrew? When we look at the ancient Hebrew, you see a lot of pictographs, and it's very important. It's like when you want to teach your child something, you put pictures out and explain the pictures. And even though they cannot read, although they cannot read, they can still understand the pictures. Well, this is what it was like in the ancient Hebrews before they understood about the letters and all these things. Or even before they were formed, they were pictures. For example, the Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, has a pictograph and it's an ox or a bull. It's a very strong animal because in the eastern, the ox or the bull is used and they're very strong animals. Uh, very hard for a man to take one of those down. And so it represents God as the leader, the powerful one. So here, the pictograph on, you know, they had almost, is the picture of water and eye and what is called a tet, the, the ninth letter. is a snake, actually. But the way it is, is the head is popping out, and then it comes down the body, and then the tail is inverted in, okay? <laughs> Some say that it's actually the picture in the old uh, Hebrew uh, picture, a picture of... Um, a woman's womb giving birth because actually the tet represents also a bride. But here he says, they almost consumed me. So let's look at the word now and the letters and what they mean. We see that the word here is actually me'et. If you take, see there's an apostrophe between the E and the A. So otherwise, if you took it out, it would be meat. So it's me'et. And here the me'et represents something that flows like water or liquid. Then there is an eye that looks at the snake. 
But understand that the, the tet actually represents also good. Now, what does that mean? Well, we see the word good in the Bible for the first time in Genesis, and it is the tet. The tet is good. And it is inverted. In, in, in all of us, we have good. We have good. But remember, we also have evil living in us, and we're not careful. That thing can rise up and hurt people. Uh, have you ever hurt anyone because evil rise up? I know I've done it. And this, you know what? It's something that we have to deal with every day. And um, so let's look at, again, he's, here he says, they almost, watch this, they almost made me little. They almost took away from me the life. They almost destroyed me. Here really is representing his name. They almost took my name and brought it down to the ground. And again, it's the picture of water, an eye, and a snake. To be less, to become fewer, to be diminished in size or the amount. Something that is few, small in size, and amount. So here we see that he says, they, they, were, they almost brought me down to nothing. Now I want to share something with you that as I was studying this, uh, I was really blessed because I remember uh, the Apostle Paul. Now, we know that the Apostle Paul got converted on the road to Damascus. And on that road to Damascus, he met Jesus, Yeshua, Hamashiach. And here, the Lord dealt with him. We know what happened. Knocked him off his horse, horse put him on the floor, and he saw a great light, a light he's never saw before, but he knew that it was God because he said, who are you, Adonai? And he said, I am Yeshua HaMashiach, whom you are persecuting. Now, this is interesting. He understood from this point on that Yeshua, Jesus, was the Lord and that he was persecuting his people. Now, watch what happens. Saul actually was his name. And later on, he changes his name from Saul to Paul. What does Saul mean? Saul means desire. Saul means one that desire. And Paul was one that desired to be a great man. We see this in Philippians, but I wanted to share with you about the name Paul, which is very important. Because I began to study it, and I looked into the Hebrew, and it's Paulos. Now, what's interesting is this, that God dealt with Paul, just like the man here in Psalms 119, verse 87. He did it for a reason. It was to humble Paul and bring him down to nothing. And so Paul changed his name from Saul, desire, to Paulos, nothing, little. That's what Paul means, little. Now here are the letters. When I looked at Paul's, the name of Paul in the Hebrew, that's what was most interesting. Paulos is this. I'm going to give you the picture graph of the name. The mouth that is connected to a master teacher that is connected to a thorn. But this master teacher is one that preserves and protects and keeps in memory. Remember that Paul said that he was given a thorn because of all the revelations that he received? He was given a thorn to keep him humble. And he says this was a thorn from Satan. And he said this, he asked three times, Lord, take this thorn away from me. He said, no, for my grace is sufficient for you. Why? He says, because in your weakness, my strength is made perfect or seen perfect. And so we see that here, Paulos, who became a great teacher to the Christian church, had thorns. And they constantly persecuted him. As a matter of fact, when you look at, at, at um, the life of Paul and what he went through, wow, the persecutions were immense. I mean, he was, he was stoned. I mean, to the point that they left him for dead. They dragged him outside the city. They whipped him. People, and when he, in the book of Acts, they said, get rid of him. I mean, the man was constantly afflicted by his own people. And yet God did this to bring him to a low state. And here he says, they almost finished me. What do you mean? That means that God allowed this person to go through a time of heavy trial and tribulation. And yet through it all, he says, I did not forsake your Lord. Now watch this. The word, they almost consumed me. Here the word is, watch this, cow. And it means, it's two pictures. It's just basically two pictures. It's the picture of an of a, of a enclosure, like a palm held tight, and a shepherd's staff. He says, they almost consumed me. 
Now remember that this picture represents a, a palm that is bent like a carved out vessel, but it represents also the shepherd's staff. But it represents this, a person that is submitted to the will of God, but actually is a picture of an animal that needs to be tamed to work. Watch this now. You don't take a bull or you don't take a calf or you don't take an ox and just put him on the, on the cart, in front of the cart to push it. He needs to learn how to walk straight. He needs to understand that the yoke is put upon him and the master that is driving the cart, he is in charge and where you should go. And you see what God does to us when we're proud or we're seeking our own way or to do our own will. What God does is that he, put a, he puts a yoke upon us and the yoke is usually representing the staff. And yet, watch this. Jesus said, if you're tired and you're weary and heavy burden, he says, come to me. I will give you rest for my yoke is easy and my burden light. And he puts his yoke upon us so that we might learn how to walk straight. And what's interesting is that while the ox is pulling the cart, the shovel, the, the shovel in the cart is making a furrow. And a furrow is basically a straight line that's digging into the ground so that the, the, the farmer then can come and put his seed in the furrow and then put the dirt over it so that it can grow. So without the calf walking straight, you would have all these zigzag line, lines and it's not good to plant like that. And so it's important that the animal learns to be tamed to the will of the owner. And this is the exact thing what he is saying here in this word, kala. Kala means again, again, a closed hand that has the shepherd's staff, but the hay represents self-expression or looking out of a window but it represents life and grace. And so sometimes when we're going through the trials and tribulations and we feel this yoke upon us and we say, God, this thing is too heavy. It's going to diminish me. It's going to bring me to a place where I can't be able to function anymore. God says, not true because my burden is easy and my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And this is the best thing that he says it's his yoke and God knows how to yoke you to himself. He knows not to put upon you more than you can bear. You will rarely see an ox that's, that's struggling and fall to the ground because the farmer knows. He knows the strength of the ox and how much pressure to put on it. And so here, Kala, remember that it talks about a hand that is powerful but it's closed, but it, it also represents a hand that is open. And we have to be the one that is open. God, carve me out. Take out those things that keep me from walking in your perfect will. This is what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, brethren, in view of God's mercy. Look at the past. See everything he has done. Read and see everything that he has accomplished in view of God's mercy. Present your bodies like an ox. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is pleasing in his sight. This is your acceptable service of worship. He says, become like the ox. Put, let him put the yoke upon you. And this is what he says, and do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might know what is the good, the acceptable and the perfect will of God. I know when I first got converted, I did things and it was good. But then I understood what was acceptable. And now I understand what the perfect will of God is. God is teaching me. God is teaching my wife. God wants to teach you how to walk straight, to make furrows on the ground so that the seeds of God can be planted. And here he says, I was almost consumed. They almost took me out. Where? Upon the earth. Now the word earth is interesting because the word in the Hebrew is eretz. Now, when I looked at this word earth, it really, it really uh, intrigued me. But let me give you the picture graph of the word earth. It is a head. Watch this. It is a head and it is a seed. It is. But the Hebrew letters represent three. The Aleph, the first letter. The Resh, we, we haven't gotten there yet, but it is the, it is the, uh, the 20th letter. And we have the Sadi which is the 19th letter. Watch this now. This is how it works. These letters represent, Aleph represents the name of Yahweh. 
Like I said, that's the name that he revealed to Moses in front of the burning bush. But then the resh represents the head or the principal uh, part of the beginning. You'll find this easily in the word, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, beginning. That is representing the resh, the principal corner of all of creation, or the beginning of first things. And then you have the sadi, which represents righteousness. So why did God create the earth? The main purpose is that we might know the name of God, that we might follow his headship, his leadership, and that we might display his righteousness on the earth. And he said, they almost took me out of the earth. In other words, he was going through so much, they said, they will almost wipe me out. But watch this, God, whose name and who's the head and who is righteousness was upon this person. Watch this. But it also represents broken pieces of pottery where commonly things were used to write on. And it's interesting that when we're broken, that God at his... Listen, this is the time when God does his best for us. He writes on us. He inscribes his will in our hearts. When we're broken is the best time to walk with God. It is the best time to serve God. We can't serve God if we're not broken. We need to be broken to serve God. And watch this now. It talks about broken fragments of, of pot of the pot, which is, again, a surface to write the message. And you know that when a pot was broken, they used to take pieces of the pot. They used to write messages on it and give it to a person to run with it as a messenger to take it to the person. It was, a, it was a cheap way to write. So watch this. How God does. He breaks pieces. He breaks us. And he puts messages inside of us. You know the best time when you share the word of God is when you're broken. Is when God gives you the message. I'm going to go to Ezekiel for a second. And watch this now. Ezekiel was in the time of the Babylonian captivity. He was a high priest. But he was also a prophet. And you know what? The Bible says in the first chapter, first verse, he talks about how God, well, you know what? Let's just go there. I mean, there's nothing like going to the word of God. Chapter one, verse one, just to read this real quickly. It says, and it happened in the 13th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth of, in the fifth of the month, as I was among the captives, you see that by the river of, of Hebar, which is Babylonian, the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. What was he doing there? It was here where he saw the captives. It was here when he saw the, the, the poverty of the people. It was here that he saw the hurt of the people. Then the heavens were open and God began to speak to him. And I noticed one thing, that you cannot minister to people when you have not been where they are. And we have to be broken. And the reason that God took this person through the persecution and through the affliction and where he said, listen, I'm almost gone, is because God wanted to write a message on him. And he knew this. And he said, but I forsook not thy precepts. Wow. That is what the test is for. The test is so that when we're going through the trials, when we're going through the fires, we learn to trust God and say, God, I am not going to forget your word. Folks, this word has eternity in it. So every time you pick it up, you pick up the weight of eternity. And if you open the book, the weight of eternity goes into your eyes, into your heart, into your mind, and it becomes like a rock, a stone that cannot be broken. Jesus said, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice will be like a wise man that built his house upon the rock. The rain came. The trials came. The, 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 the winds blew upon the house, but it did not fall. But anyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains came. It beat upon it. The wind came upon it. And it fell with a great crash. You notice both houses went through the same trials. One stood still. One stood strong. The other one fell. Why? Because those who put their hope and their trust in the rock of God, this, you will never fall. And he says here, but I, meaning a singular term, oni, is the word in the Hebrew, forsook, 
not. Now, the word forsook, very simple, is three picture graphs. It is the eye, a sword, and the house. Look what he said here. But I did not leave my home. I didn't go away or neglected my responsibility to my family or to what you have given me. And here is the eye of the sword that is in the house. In other words, I stood in the house. I held the sword of God. Hello, here it is. Mm. The sword of God. And I protected the house. Amen. I protected the house. And this is what God wants you to do. Protecting a house means this. I did not forsake your precepts. Picar. I love it. What is Picar? Picar is this. Your statutes, that which has been written in your ordinances, but it's the picture of, it's three pictures. Watch this. First of all, it is the fade, the cough, and the resh. And this is the picture graph. A mouth. Holiness and a door the mouth that has holiness in the door you see this you see your lips that's a door and when we speak we should speak the oracles of god i did not forsake speaking your word i kept it in my mouth all the time i was always speaking the word back to myself joshua 1 8 do not let this book of the law here it is again look at it do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth but you shall meditate day and night so that you be careful to do everything that is written in it. Then shall you make your way prosperous and successful. If you want to be successful in the spirit, you got to put spirit words in your mind and in your heart. That's what Proverbs chapter 4 verse 20 through 22 says. It says, my son, attend to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from out of the midst of thine heart, for they are health unto those that find them and medicine to all their flesh. And then he says this, verse 23, and guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. If you want your life to be right, keep this in your heart and you'll never have trouble discerning God's will. Have a wonderful spirit-filled day and remember your God your Lord, your Savior, he is strong in the midst of you. No matter what you go through, forsake not his word. God bless.